And hello everyone. I trust you can all hear me. I trust the audio is good and my connection is sound. Please drop a one in the chat to let me know that all is well. So yeah, thank you all for being here on this Monday evening at seven o'clock in Warsaw. It's getting cold. Um, yeah, tonight we're talking about Darwin, but I will also show you something I'm working on, which is part two of John Moses Calvin. Hey, Vegetal. Hey, Horse. XYZ, welcome. Good to see you. Harry L. Johnson, very welcome. Good to see you. Thank you for the support. Little Low Mine, hello. <laughs> welcome. Joel Thomas, Natalie Hartz, welcome. Good to see you all. All right, Let, let's jump into this. Um, <clears throat> we're right from Bratislava. Fantastic. I I hope to go there soon. Um, well, <laughs> well, I mean, just I do hope to go. <laughs> I've heard great things about the city. My colleagues have been there and in the past. And it was really good. Uh, let me let me go here. Um, part two of my series on John Calvin uh, is ready. Uh, I finished it. I managed to finish it today. No Shabo, welcome. Good to see you, James Alexander. Welcome. So Calvin thought of himself as the new Moses. Um, oddly enough, and I call this one Theologus Amator. In other words, it's Latin for amateur theologian because John Calvin was an amateur theologian. The man was a complete idiot when it came to Christian doctrine. Uh, from what I'm seeing, the, the man was a complete yeah, loser when it came to the Bible and basic Christian doctrine. He contradicted it all over the place. I mean, the worst I've seen is Zwingli. Um, Zwingli is like a five-year-old with a crayon writing scripture, but um, yeah, Calvin is smarter, but <laughs> just, it sounds good. It's complete trash. So I will do this later in the week. Um, this is also 25. <laughs> oh, right, text. Thank you. Um, yeah. So yeah, the, the clown of theology. Um, so we will talk about this in the future. Uh, <laughs> Sandro Correa, the Lloyd Dets. I like that. <laughs> Welcome. Um, yeah. So guys, uh, yeah. Um, I get, I get annoyed by certain things, by bad logic. Um, when I talk about, Calvin, in the next episode, I'm going to be discussing, it's going to be detailed, and I, I will be repeating certain points, so please be aware of that, but I need to hammer home logic. Now, faith does not exclude logic. Faith does not exclude reason. God is logos. God is reason. So, we have to love God with all our heart, and also all our mind. And within the Bible context, the context of the Bible Mind is with proof, with reason. God is logos. God is logical. God is consistent because there are rules that God operates with. Of course, Calvin disagrees and he has a very, well, he worships Allah, as far as I can tell, with Christian characteristics. But this is an argument I've seen. Those who've been making this argument know who they are. And I want to address this quickly. This just came up shortly before I went live. Can't God use evil people for his own will? It's very clear that Luther was a very problematic individual, but that doesn't mean God couldn't have used him. In other words, Hitler was a very troubled individual, but see, maybe God used him for a godly purpose. And, you know, maybe because I'm trying to make excuses for Hitler, or maybe, you know, Muhammad actually did some good, you know, and maybe God was using him for a good purpose and he might have been problematic, but that doesn't mean God wasn't using Hitler and Muhammad and Marx for, for good purposes, you know, because surely you can, you know, God can use bad people to do good. So obviously these were good people doing good things, Lloyd, you 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 bigot against against Hitler, you okay. So <clears throat> Yeah, uh, James Alexander says, yeah, God was wrong for 1,500 years and used the worst person imaginable to correct his mistakes. Yes, and I want to talk about this. My first point, false teachers. Okay, hold on. The, the reason for this is, uh, let me actually go to the reason why. I wrote today, I spent some time after work, I spent some time today writing this. Uh, I thought about this at length. Now, this is called, this is an article I wrote called A Week defense of Luther and Lutheranism. So this is on my community page. It's also on my coffee shop page as an article. Uh, yes, little mind. Thank you for the reminder. Please like, subscribe, and share. Make jihad on the like button. So I wrote this today, and this is a series, this is a logical analysis of, 
of Luther because Thaddeus said on a stream with me, and this, this stream was in a reaction to my discussion of Luther's major flaws where they threw Luther under the bus and claimed they didn't um, with David Suarez, that, um, well, you know, the if you look at the, the formula of Concord and you look at the Lutheran church, they've already distanced themselves from many of the teachings of Luther. Well, there's an implication to that. There are some serious serious implications, negative implications of the fact of Lutherans moving away from Martin Luther's original doctrines, because this undermines the authority of Luther. And if Luther, who claimed to speak for God and to bring the truth, and he was getting his illumination, his enlightenment, his knowledge straight from the Bible, he was getting it from sola scriptura, and then he had to be corrected afterwards, then what does this say about Luther's ability to, you know, this undermines Luther completely. It undermines Protestantism as a whole. It undermines the Lutheran church. Because if Luther is wrong, then he didn't have anything that was eternal. And what else is wrong? It's a very slippery slope. So please please read this. Um, this is a series of questions which detail the issues with this with this um, claim that yes, we, we did this. But now let's go to this. False teachers do more harm than good. God does not need evil people to accomplish his will. Now, God may take an evil situation and turn it to the good, but that doesn't make it a good situation. Someone could punch you in the face and then you can go to the doctor and have your nose repaired and go to the dentist and get your teeth replaced, but that doesn't make it good because you could turn it to good. It still means you got punched in the face and lost some teeth and broke your nose. That doesn't make it good. That means you are trying to recover from a bad situation. So God is all-powerful and God is sovereign. We believe this as Christians. So he can use anyone he chooses. So there is no reason that God would need to use those who spread falsehoods and lead others astray. Right? God would be working against them to turn either them to the good or to turn the situation to the good. But this does not make this person good or make what they are doing good. Evil actions produce evil results. I will speak about this in my Calvin, part two of Calvin. I will discuss this particular thing from a biblical point of view. And I don't just mean because, you know, the, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and therefore I had perfect enlightenment like Luther, which had to be changed 20 minutes later by his followers. But, but evil actions produce evil results. Evil trees bear evil fruits. We cannot expect good fruit from corrupt trees, as the Bible very clearly tells us. And I will cover this in length, in length on the Calvin episode. So we need to judge prophets and leaders by the fruit of their actions and message, not make excuses for them. This is making excuses for them. This is trying to explain things away. So endorsing or excusing false prophets only spreads their evil influence. We must not make compromises with evil. We must call evil by its name, unless the person that was writing to me objects. And they did seem to want to object. I know there are many who want to object and say, well, you know, because I'm a Lutheran, um, actually God was using him. And, and also I, I was able to sift through the bad and stick my hand in the poop and pull out the jewels that were stuck in. The yeah, sure you did. There are many godly leaders and prophets who spread the true gospel message. We should follow and endorse them, not make excuses for false ones. Why are you following off with this bad guy and saying, well, you know, sure, he, he's, he's, he's dropping a lot of poop here, but I'm going to stick my fingers in the poop and pull out the good stuff you know, and ignore the poop. I'll just, I'll just wash my, why don't you just go to someone who's not doing that? Okay. So just follow the good guys, right? The good guys exist. I'm sure. Don't make excuses for the false ones. God's true servants reflect God's goodness. They do not promote evil. And we are commanded to test all the spirits. Now there's a whole story. Now look, I'm not the greatest theologian. So I have to rely on a lot of, I have to rely on a lot of, of, of writing. I've got to go through a lot of sources and hopefully reliable sources. Now, we have to test them, okay? I don't, know, I don't mean like evil spirits. This is testing the spirit that someone is speaking from, the position they're coming from, right? We need to reject things that are found false. We need a method for doing so reliably. And excusing these people is direct disobedience to Scripture. Now, God does not expect us to jump through hoops trying to figure out what is good and what is bad from false teachers to rescue the good mixed in with their poop. As I was saying, excuse my French, we could just go straight to the good elsewhere without sticking our fingers in their dirt. Now, even a stopped clock is right twice a day, except you don't know when that clock is right unless you have a working clock. Now, if you have a working clock, why are you invested in a broken clock? 
Now, this accident of accuracy doesn't make the broken clock God's chosen clock. It doesn't make it reliable. It doesn't make it useful. It's broken. It is re- accidentally reliable. Understand? So you are trying to you are trying to pretend that this evil, this wrongness, this error is good somehow. You are making excuses for evil. You are part of the problem. You are not part of the solution. So yes, you can identify, but to make excuses, that that for me is a problem. So these are my thoughts on the issue. Uh, hopefully this was helpful and useful. A broken clock belongs in the trash, not on the wall. <laughs> 480 p.m. So sorry. So guys, I hope this makes sense. I'm trying my best to be to be very very logical when I present this because, and I I will do a series and I will do especially in the upcoming Calvin episode discussion on logic because this is sorely lacking within the Protestant theology within the Protestant foundation and we will be discussing that much more. I've got a lot coming up on that. Okay. Let's go on. So we've discussed how the Protestant theologians were Darwinists and supported the Nazis and even wrote him a little Nazi Bible, as they called it. Not really, though. It was just a New Testament, a modified New Testament, but so on. But then let's talk about, I think we, okay, yeah, let's go to this slide. This is where we are. So guys, I hope that made sense. Um, because if I believe it is true, and I believe that it is reliably true, and I can prove it with evidence, with, with good evidence, then I think I need to speak up. Um, Natalie Hartz, thank you. That's a very kind comment. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, broken clock is correct twice a day. That doesn't make it, as I said, God's chosen clock. It's a broken clock. Throw it away, right? Get one that works. Don't invest yourself in a broken clock. So, yeah. Okay, now... Atheists want to claim that Darwin is misrepresented. No, Darwinism is evil, right? Darwin was also, no, there were scientists who, many scientists went against Darwin. They were ignored. Even the guy who co- who co-discovered um, Darwin's idea of natural selection was very, very spiritual, right? Not a Christian, but very spiritual. And also believed in a sort of theistic evolution. And Darwin ignored all of that. I mentioned, I, I went through a list of, of scientists that Darwin completely ignored because he didn't want any concept of the religious, of the spiritual to enter into his idea. He wanted to eliminate God completely. For Even for Marx, Marx was of the idea that God was eliminated from the world by Darwinism. I think the same for Hitler, but we will discuss Hitler at length in this as we go through. So I should do another episode of this. Now, scientists, do they misrepresent Darwin or are they accurately representing Darwin? And as we showed in the previous episode, they are accurately representing Darwin. So, the war of annihilation is a natural law without which the organic world could not continue to exist at all. In other words, we have to bring death. We have to eliminate the weak. We have to wipe out our rivals. Otherwise, the natural world would not exist because death makes way for life. That's why we discussed last week, Darwinism is a death cult. It is it is based on these Gnostic, pagan, sophist, Greek ideas, these insane ideas that Darwin simply wrapped and painted and he put lipstick on the pig and he called it science. This is German zoologist Gustav Jaeger in 1870. So this is in relation to obviously Darwin's works. Just as in nature, the struggle for existence is the moving principle of evolution. The struggle for existence. That's so, you have to think of that as the war for existence, the fight for existence. And so also in world history, the destruction of the weaker nations through the stronger is a postulate of progress. So we know we are progressing when we wipe out our neighbors. So this is clearly taken, these are the best minds in Germany. And Darwin endorsed this, right? German ethnologist Friedrich Helwald, 1875. Let me just drink something. Um, to me, their nonsense is at the same level of Muslim scientists. Whatever affirms my position is neutral is regarded as science. Yeah. Marx was desperate for a foundation for his theory. Yes, and Darwin did provide it. Correct. Right. Now, such mating is contrary to the will of nature for a higher breeding of all life. The precondition for this does not lie in associating superior and inferior but in the total victory of the superior. The stronger must dominate and not blend with the weaker. 
thus sacrificing his own greatness. That's Adolf Hitler. Now understand, this is exactly in line also with the Mohammedan, the Muslim idea that they have to dominate, right? And also they don't marry with those who are outside of their tribe, right? They've got very strict rules about that. Note the parallels here with Islam. So now we go to a man called Heraclitus, and we're going to have a look at where this idea comes from, because we've already established, I think, the struggle for existence. Yes, Hitler did use that, and that name was, that term was changed. We will see how that term was changed, because it was too loaded, it was too associated with immorality, with warfare, with destruction and death, so they had to change it to the survival of the fittest. See, the struggle for existence implied directly killing your neighbor, okay? Thou shalt kill my neighbor and take his stuff. And therefore, they changed it to a pagan, taken from Greek paganism. It is in Mein Kampf, just checked, yes. So war is father of all. And we will be talking about that from Darwin to the First World War and pre-First World War German theology, German, well, just, well we call it their, their political theology, let's say. Um, the idea is the political ideology that was based on Darwinism, which led to the First World War and other atrocities prior to that, other genocides prior and then into World War II. We're going to discuss that. So, <clears throat> Heraclitus. So, we've already established that Darwin is based on paganism. He's repeating nothing different than the pagans did two and a half thousand years before him. Right? Yes, much better to marry your cousin than the riffraff. Exactly, horse. So, War is father of all and king of all. War renders some gods and others men. He makes some slaves and others free. That's Heraclitus. So again, we've already established the link between paganism and Darwinism. It's simply Darwinism is just scientific paganism, if you will. Now, Heraclitus also writes, couples are holes and not holes. What agrees disagrees. The concordant is discordant. From all things one, and from one, all things. That's Heraclitus. So let's analyze this. Let's try to apply basic non-contradictory logic, basic Aristotelian logic to this. Couples are holes and not holes. This is a contradiction. One is one, but one is also five. A leaf is green, but a leaf is also blue. This is a contradiction. Something cannot be both a whole and not a whole at the same time. This violates the basic law of non-contradiction. Atheists claim to be logical. This is illogical. But, go on. What agrees, disagrees. The concordant is discordant. Again, this is contradictory. Things that agree with each other cannot disagree with each other simultaneously. This is illogical. From all things one, and from one, all things. So this is incoherent. This is this is Buddhist gobbledygook. I'm a man, but also a man. <laughs> yep, <laughs> yes, vegetal. So, there is no evidence to suggest that all things come from one thing, or that one thing produces all things. This claim is not grounded in any observable fact. Now, it's not, you could say, well, you know, everything comes from God, and God is not, that's not what we're talking about here, right? This claim is not grounded in any observable fact. It contains contradictions and is unsubstantiated. It is incoherent because it does not provide clear meaning or logical coherence. It is making a generalization or universal claim, but the lack of specification and logical structure makes it unclear and ambiguous. This guy is simply just mouthing off, but unfortunately his concept of war is what made its way into Darwin's pagan science. So Heraclitus' thoughts are chaotic, just like how nothing but chaos and all things negative. Yes. XYZ, well, good to have you back. It's blathering, exactly, thank you. But understand, th this concept is not violated in any way by Darwinism. Darwinism took this concept on board wholesale. So here are my equally fake quotes that I wrote. The empty is full, silence is loud, stillness is motion, all comes from nothing, and to nothing all returns. Parmenides, who doesn't exist, I made that up. The same is different, the different is same, ignorance is knowledge, knowledge is ignorance, up is down, in is out, anaximander. Made that up as well. There is no truth, all is false, reality is illusion, illusion is reality, life is death, death is life, war is peace, freedom is slavery. Protagoras. He didn't say that. The part contains the whole. The whole contains the part. The beginning has no end. The end has no beginning. Existence exists not. Non-existence not exists. Thales. Yeah, I'm mixing up a whole bunch of stuff here. I'm just trying to be... But understand, it sounds fantastic. It sounds, ooh, like, oh wow, this is so wise. It's nonsense. 
Hot is cold and cold is hot. Good is bad and bad is good. Justice is injustice and injustice is justice. Democracy is dictatorship and dictatorship is democracy. All contradictions harmonize. Well, okay, these people existed. Protagoras and Aximander tells, tell us they all existed. They're real people, but Parmenides, but the, the quotes are just fiction, okay? And this is Xenarchus. Xenarchus never existed. That's just a made up name. Yeah, so the law of non contradiction is out of the window with this guy. Exactly. They don't follow the laws of logic, the basic three laws of logic. Now, how is this for meaningless pontificating and twisting of logic and semantics? It's poetry. It sounds wonderful. It's all fiction. I, I made these quotes up. All right. So this is atheist logic. This is Darwinist logic. And why do I say that? Because 91% of atheists who don't believe in atheism are Darwinists. 91% of atheists believe in Darwinism. They might say, well, you know, atheist is not to believe. It's a lack of belief. But we, 91% of us believe in Darwinism. So just leave it at that. So let's look at Jerry Coyne, Liberal Creationism. And there's two articles I'm quoting. The one is in the New Republic, Creationism for Liberals, and Freedom from Religion Foundation, Free Thought Today, Evolution and Atheism, Best Friends Forever by Jerry Coyne. Jerry Coyne's a well-known atheist. So yeah, he doesn't contradict the idea that 91% of, Dar of atheists are Darwinists and 91% of Darwinists are atheists. Over its history, science has delivered two crippling blows to humanity's self-image. The first was Galileo's announcement in 1632 that our Earth was just another planet and not, as scripture implied, the center of the universe. The second and more severe landed in 1859. Charles Darwin published On the Origin of Species, not On the Origin of Life, Species, and demolishing in 545 pages the comforting notion that we are unique among all species, the supreme object of God's creation. This is the fall of man, right? That's why he called it the you know, the devolution of man, something like that. You know, he was writing a new fall of man. And the only creatures earthly travails could be cashed in for a comfortable afterlife. Writing in the New Republic, The Evolution of God by Robert Wright. Okay, now the fact of evolution is not only inherently atheistic, but it is inherently anti-theistic. It goes against the notion that there is a God. And these atheists have made this very, very clear. So now, not all German Darwinists, scientific, so now talk about scientific racism, which Darwin started, thanks Darwin. Not all German Darwinists defended war as a biological imperative. Okay, some criticized war. Actually, I may be repeating a couple of slides that we had before, but some criticized war for undermining natural selection. So they felt that war was accelerating natural selection and might be taking a few samples out of the human race or the gene pool that, you know, we should have left behind, but okay. They feared that wars in Europe would kill off too many of the superior races. Because, look, go kill the inferior races. Would you mind, you know, the guys that look a little bit like this, go kill those guys off, you know, leave the nice guys alone. So the pacifist Darwinists tended to approve of wars against races they considered lower on the evolutionary scale, like the native Africans. They criticized war based on the fact that it was killing superior races. The, the Europeans, remember, they had the view, they had the view that the, the European races, the white races were superior and that the black races were very similar to baboons. They were, they were in fact evolutionarily just ahead of baboons. They were like an in-between species, much lower on the genetic scale, right? So in German South, in Germany, in German Southwest Africa, now known as Namibia, let me actually just fix that slide because I realize that's a small typo. Um, sorry, in German, there we go. Okay. So, in German Southwest Africa, now known as Namibia, the social Darwinism of German military leaders moved from theory to practice in the years leading up to World War I. So, the, so where do these moral Darwinists get their morals from? They, they claim that Darwinism gives the world morals, but of course other atheists claim that there are no morals. And so, I mean, you've, we, I've spoken about um, Dawkins, Richard Dawkins, who makes some ridiculous claims, and then these guys can't make up their minds. So, the German military attempted to eradicate the Herero people in southwest Africa in what some scholars consider the first genocide of the 20th century. But this, the atrocities against these people started well before the 20th century, started like 30 years prior, right? Started 14 years after Darwin had written and published in 1859 on the origin of species. So, in 1873, already they had started persecuting and oppressing these people. So, more than 80% of the Herero population and 50% of the Nama population was slaughtered between 1904 and 1908. Their persecution began in 1884. Could be earlier than that. Okay. <clears throat> so, ideas have consequences. 
So the Herero invasion occurred only 14 years after the Descent of Man was published. Right, this is from the Oxford Handbook of Genocide Studies. And you can see here what was happening to these people. So the German general's measures were, from a military standpoint, not necessary anymore. The rebelling Herero had been defeated in the Battle of Hamakari in 1904. But despite having defeated the Hereros, who fought back, who were starving, as you can see, they wanted to wipe them out. So the German general Lothar von Trotter's motives for the annihilation of the Herero were racist and social Darwinist. He was a devout social Darwinist. As the following excerpt from an article written by the general reveals, at the outset, we cannot do without the natives. We need them as slaves, but they finally have to melt away. What a lovely way of saying it. Where the climate allows the white man to work, philanthropic views cannot banish Darwin's law of survival of the fittest. So let me see. Philanthropic views cannot banish Darwin's law of survival of the fittest. Yes, Andrew Martin, that is correct. Survival of the fittest has to be helped along with genocide. And that's what it means. And this is what they implemented. Very simple. So this is what atheism Pedro Jr. has brought to the world. Justified racism and genocide, but Christianity is evil. Correct. Conociendo al Islam. Hello there. Welcome. Right. Now, Lothar von Trotter's superiors in Berlin and even the emperor shared the racist worldview of their general because it's scientific. It's Darwinist. So the first genocide of the 20th century, the dehumanizing tendencies of Darwin's racism played a key role in the genocide ordered by General Trotter during the Herero revolt. Now, most Germans considered black Africans little more than animals. One missionary stated that the average German looks upon and treats the natives as creatures being more or less on the same level as baboons, their favorite word to describe the natives, and deserving to exist only insofar as they are of some benefit to the white man, as they can be slaves and be of assistance, otherwise they need to be wiped out. You can see where this is going, to the genocide of the Jews in the Holocaust. Yes, yes, correct. It's exactly where it goes. So this is John M. Bridgman, and he said, The average German looks down upon the natives as being about on the same level as the higher primates, baboon being their favorite term for the natives, and treats them like animals. This is science. Exactly, Ernesto. This is true science. The, witness the science. Witness the science. Thanks, atheists. Thanks, thanks Darwinists. Thanks, scientists. Awesome stuff. The average pro-choice activist here looks upon and treats pre-born children more or less on the same level as tumors. Now that's a quote that I found online. <clears throat> okay, someone someone was talking was was talking about atheists who who have a completely obviously pro-abortion stance. And then this is a this is a real quote I found. Okay. But understand the position here. Understand the parallels between these two positions. You have upset the matrix again, Lloyd. I've missed most of the past 10 minutes. That is crazy, horse. You know, we need to talk sometime. Seriously, you, you need to do something about that. You know, seriously, you always say no, but but we need to chat one day. Yeah, I've seen pro-choice say the same. Exactly. I know that this is a genuine quote. I This is a genuine quote. I've taken this. Um, so even the pro-choice usage is misleading. Of course, the whole thing is misleading. It's sophistry. Okay. Rick Johnson, I know it's not only the Jews being killed in the Holocaust. Yes, we're well aware of that, but he specifically targeted the Jews, right? In fact, he targeted the Slavs. He killed 20% of the Polish nation. So yeah, he didn't like the Slavs either. We know that General Trocha stated in a newspaper article that Germans should not resist his order of extermination on the basis of the economic value of the Hereros. In other words, they have no economic value. So kill them. Which is fascinating. As you know, that there was the economist Kinsey, or whatever, whatever his name was, I discussed him in the previous episode, who was very much intimately involved with, with the Darwin family. So, yeah, so you've got Keynesian economics involved with Darwinism, and this guy's talking about economic value. So, do you understand there's this overlap here? So, now, such a mentality breeds harshness, deceit, exploitation, injustice, rape, and not infrequently murder as well. And we have spoken about how atheists have claimed that this is all legitimately fine. It's moral. Atheists have claimed, as you've seen, these scientists, these PhDs, claiming this is moral and acceptable under their particular worldview, their Darwinist worldview. Interesting. How could a Darwinist use animal as a racially derogatory term? Everyone is just an animal in their view. Yeah, but they're superior animals. They are the greatest, highest of creation, right? 
Yeah. True. Yeah, I guess they have chosen Darwin over Yeshua. That we need to counter that. We need to reverse that. What's hilarious is my ancestors, Austrian Jews, were some of the most productive and best building the economy in Europe. Yes, that is true, Count Burger. So yeah. Um so now, on October 2, 1904, General Lothar von Trotha issued what became known as his extermination order, declaring the Hereros either had to leave German Southwest Africa or face extinction. Herero men would be executed. Herero women and children would be driven into the desert where they would die of starvation or dehydration. Von Trotha justified his extermination campaign by an explicit appeal to Darwinism, telling one newspaper that human feelings of philanthropy could not override the laws of Darwin, right? The struggle of the fittest. So when Von Trotha's extermination campaign provoked a backlash, a new plan was developed to move the remaining Hereros to concentration camps where many more would die from malnutrition, disease, and exhaustion. Right. Thanks, Count Buga. So, in these death camps, the Hereros, the Hereros were subject to medical experiments by German doctors, and their skulls were collected for shipment back to Germany to be studied by experts in racial science. Thank you, Count Buga. Much appreciated. I really appreciate the support. Thank you, everyone. Much appreciated. So, what's the point behind these videos? Um, you know... Dorp, I have no interest in your... Um, I'm going to put you in timeout. I'm not going to ban you outright. But, um, you know, what is fascinating is that atheists are constantly trying to claim immorality within Christianity to prove their position of superior morality, of presenting themselves as a superior ideology. Except when you look at how utterly, disgustingly filthy, filthy atheism is, with its long list of atrocities, having murdered more people in 87 years in the 20th century than all other nations on earth having done in the previous 1900 years. When you see the disgusting morality expressed by these PhD atheists saying that rape is acceptable, slavery is acceptable, murder is acceptable, then you start to wonder, you were claiming, lying, by the way, about certain historical events also related to religion, especially Christianity. And then you want to present an alternative that you are lying about because this alternative is disgusting. So you want to use a claim of immorality against Christianity to debunk it. And yet when we can demonstrate how utterly filthy, disgusting, putrid atheism is, you want to go like, well, well, you know, you can't debunk something on the basis of itself being immoral. And seriously, you know, um, yeah, that, that's a really weak defense. So, so besides, silly child, this is not a debunking of evolution. We're talking about the implications of Darwinism, the actions of Darwinists, the, the genocidal nature of Darwinists, the, the filthy morals of Darwinists. I'm not here discussing evolution. I'm talking about Darwin, who used to like to kill small animals with scalpels, with rocks, with his bare hands, with hammers, with sticks. You know, we, we call people who kill small animals, who murder little animals with hammers and bash thousands of animals heads in for the fun of it. They, we call them psychopaths, right? And when Darwin's ideas are literally the very same ideas as Hitler, Stalin, Mao, and a bunch of pagan Greek atheists from, you know, pagans, then, then we've got to think, is this really science? Or is this simply a lie about science? Well, yes, the answer is it's a lie about science, and Darwin was a psychopath, and he introduced psychopathy. So this is simply atheists claiming that psychopathy, disgusting evil, is science. So, yes, horse, yes, progressive do try to use up the higher ground, the moral high ground, but it is one of the rules for radicals, probably. Yeah. I mean, disgusting pigs, as you can see. Christianity is bad because of bad Christians, then bad atheists don't make atheism bad. Correct, Stephen Young? That's that's very true. Yeah, it's like uh, atheist hypocrisy. So, let me see. Death camps, medical experiments, skulls collected. Sound familiar? Yes, it is very familiar. Very, very astute point, Andrew Martin. Right. And flying spaghetti monsters in the multiverse. Yep. So, let's see. So now, by 1908, as I said, more than 80% of the Herero people in that area had been eliminated. But, of course, if Christians had done this, we would be hearing this 24-7 for the next thousand years by atheists going, well, well, well Darwinist atheists did this, so let's, let's bleat about this, right? So, yeah. Now, skulls snatched from Africa by German scientists trying to prove Europeans were the master race. Oh, my. Oh, my. This is the, 
This started in the 1800s after Darwin and then continued into the early 1900s. The master race, wasn't that a Hitler idea? Yes, it was. So did it come before Hitler? Of course, did this originate with Hitler? Not at all. It originated with Charles Darwin. This nonsense originated with Charles Darwin, the master race. He gave it scientific leverage. All right. So, yeah, <laughs> this... Yeah, yeah, these brilliant atheists are as peaceful as Abdul's, exactly, this atheist religion of peace. So, so understand, so people celebrated the return of these skulls, right? And of course, these were these atheists, these lovely, lovely atheists. Of course, the fact that, that over a hundred million people were murdered by atheists doesn't make atheism bad, because the atheist making the claim didn't himself pull the trigger at any point, you know, but, but fine. Um, yeah, but there you go, this is what they did, because these people... Atheists, scientific atheists who are smarter than all of us put together, right? As you know, when you become an atheist, your IQ goes up by 40 points. They did this because these people were just monkeys. That's what they believed. Real atheism wasn't tried. Well, yeah, real Christianity wasn't tried either. Yeah. Okay, so war is good for nature. Let's have a look. So German military leaders then prepared for the next European conflict. So in 1912, German general Friedrich von Benhardi published a bestseller called Germany and the Next War. You can see it in the back here. Actually, let me just go back here to, I didn't correctly do all of these. Let me just go one more slide. <clears throat> yeah, let me just fix this up. Yeah, it's, yeah, I should have done this. Excellent. So this is the book in the back here, Germany and the Next War by General Friedrich von Benhardi, right? You can download this. You can find it on archive.org. Probably you can download it as well. It's available. So, struggling for existence. Yeah, we're going to be talking more about that. Did the English think the same regarding the Irish? They probably did. And um, look, you, you'll you find that there's... Yeah, well, well let's, let me just focus on this. So, in 1912, Ben Hardy published his bestseller, Germany and the Next War. He argued that the struggle for existence is, in the life of nature, the basis of all healthy development. In other words, killing your neighbor right? Not thou shalt not kill, love thy neighbor, kill your neighbor, right? Is the basis of all healthy development. Therefore, war is a biological necessity. Remember, Darwin said that out of death comes the development of greater life, of more advanced life. This was a Darwinist position. Those are his own words. I've covered that before. So according to the atheist Darwin, right? And according to his doctrine, his, his own words, his own mouth, and therefore those who believe in Darwinism, war and murder genocide is necessary to improve the species and if they kill you it's for the good of life love thy neighbor versus kill those people correct andrew martin so spider 1132 thank you and um thank you very much wow that's amazing news he says that um god bless you lloyd you and sam shamoon are two big guides and teachers that have helped me in my journey into the catholic church i will get, get baptized and convert next year okay well congratulations um so, war is good for nature, but there's still no-go zones in France from the next war this dude is talking about. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll talk about that. So, okay, let me not get too distracted by the comments. It's hard to keep up. Similar ideas can also be found among the military leaders of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And there's a lot of history on this. When you read through these, these, these academics and these military leaders, it's incredible how much they quote Darwin and how disgustingly depraved their comments become. It's, it's just filthy. Count... Franz Konrad von Hotzendorf was called by one scholar the architect of the apocalypse for his formative role in World War I. He was the chief of the general staff of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And von Hotzendorf read Darwin as a young officer and applied the Darwinian worldview to his ideas about foreign relations. After World War I started, many German thinkers invoked Darwinian theory to justify the conflict. So World War I was egged on and justified and they didn't back down because this was science. They were just doing science. They were just... This is a lab and I'm using these bullets as, as the way scientists just, we're cleansing the race, we're improving life, we're making Earth better, one bullet at a time. And this included, of course, prominent zoologist Ernst Haeckel, and he had previously been a pacifist. So we discussed Haeckel at length in the previous episode, and Haeckel had once been a pacifist, but had turned radical due to Darwin, had become a murderous Darwinist because of Darwin. Once World War I got going, Many people argued that it was part of the Darwinian struggle for existence, and therefore, it's good to go. We need this war because it's Darwinian. It's, it's bringing good. You see, all of this murder, it's, it's doing good. It's doing good. Atheists at work. 
That's atheism as work. Thank you. Right, moving on. So Ernst Haeckel even wrote a book during the war in which he called World War I part of the struggle for existence. He was horrified that the perfidious French were using black colonial troops against the superior Germans. The French were using these black colonial troops. There's a lot of images of the French having used these troops. Many people who were justifying the war, many people, sorry, were justifying the war as part of the Darwinian struggle for existence. Now you've seen here, there's another little typo I can fix. Yep, so the war was justified on Darwinian grounds. So this was not the Catholic Church or the Baptist Church or the Calvinist Church that started World War I. This was a very much a Darwinian atheist war. Understand that. Based on Darwinian principles fought by people who devoutly believed in Darwinism, this is atheism at work, one of the biggest atrocities in world history because directly of Darwin and atheism. So yeah, atheists used to shame me for being a Christian while being African because of atrocities committed by Christians, but they never told me any of this. I wonder why. Yeah, because, because this doesn't look good for Darwinism, right? This doesn't look good for atheists. This is, seriously, take these things, make screen caps, make memes, please make memes, put them on Facebook, okay? Just, just use this material, use the material. Um, you know, I'm going to make this available. I haven't finished all the slides yet, but yeah, use the material and, and just put this out there. Atheists have, do not have a leg to stand on. Right, so, but back to this topic later. So we're going to leave World War One here for a minute. We're going to go into education and then we're going to come back to World War Two. We're going to go back to Hitler and then we're going to come back to World War One, and we're going to see the, the direct consequences of Darwin's ideas on German academics. And you're going to see how, how utterly depraved and violent these ideas are. So Charles Darwin and his German support. So Charles Darwin writes to W. Prayer, March 31, 1886. This is his letter. I am delighted to hear that you uphold the doctrine of the modification of species and defend my views. The support which I receive from Germany is my chief ground for hoping that our views will ultimately prevail. So Darwin, all of these crazy Germans who were going around murdering people, committing atheist genocides, Darwin endorsed these ideas. Darwin supported them. Darwin felt that these people understood him really well. The younger naturalists are almost all on my side, and sooner or later the public must follow those who make the subject their special studies. In other words, these people believed in Darwinism the way you believe in God. They believed in Darwinism. That was their religion. And they would eventually control government, and they would control academia, and people would have to follow these ideas because these ideas would be forced down their throats as policy. Don't forget, personnel is policy. Hopefully I'm making sense. Now, a threat to the moral order. So much of the initial resistance to Darwinism sprang from a perceived moral threat, and you can see why. I thought that atheism was just a lack of belief, but here, here's Darwin saying they have doctrine. Yeah, I've covered, if you look at my series, um, if you look at my series, Atheos, right, where I discuss about 80 plus different definitions of, of atheism from major academic sources, then you'll see they do have doctrine. It is a doctrine. Academically, it is considered a doctrine. Atheists who teach atheism at university level, it's a doctrine. It's like a religion. So Adam Cedric, who was Darwin's former mentor, and I mentioned him very early on in natural science at the University of Cambridge, he's the English geologist who first applied the name Cambrian to the geological period of the time and one of the founders of modern geology, said in a letter to Darwin in 1859, after reading The Origin of Species, passages in your book greatly shocked my moral taste. So there is a moral and metaphysical part of nature as well as a physical. A man who denies this is deep in the mire of folly. It is the crown and glory of organic science that it does through final cause link material to moral. You have ignored this link. And he warns Darwin, you have ignored this link. And if I do not mistake your meaning, you have done your best in one or two pregnant cases to break it. So Darwin set out. His mentor at the University at Cambridge stated, Darwin's intention was to destroy Christian morality. Were it possible, which thank God it is not, to break it, humanity, in my mind, would suffer a damage that might brutalize it. Well, it did. It was brutalized in World War I and World War II thanks to atheist Darwinism and sink the human race into a lower grade of degradation than any into which it has fallen since its written records tell us of its history. So understand this is what happened. This actually happened. So this is very unfortunate, but Darwin did. 
Remember, atheist atrocities in the 20th century killed more people than the previous 1900 years prior. Yes, this is the mentor of Darwin at Cambridge. Yeah. Morally justified atrocities by Darwinists. When I say Darwinists, I mean atheists. So, so we've already discussed, if you look at my atheist series, I've discussed the 20th century death toll versus the previous 2000 years, right? More people died versus the previous 1900 years, right? Now, Rudolf Schmid reported in his 1876 book that many critics of Darwinism view it as an unproven hypothesis that threatens to become a torch which could reduce the most noble and highest cultural achievements of the past century to a heap of ashes. So Darwin has warned, multiple scientists warned, that this is going to cause atrocity. Daniel Dennett, the leading materialist philosopher, and I've covered this before and I'm just repeating this point, extols Darwin's dangerous idea. He wrote this in his book, Dangerous Idea, which he calls a universal acid that dissolves every ethical and moral system it encounters. In other words, Darwinism destroys morality, it destroys ethics, it means that there is no ethic, there's only the law of nature, the law of survival, the law of the jungle. Dissolving traditional ideas about religion and morality so that the atheists can push their corruption. The famous bioethicist Peter Singer and his compatriot James Rachels argue that because Darwinism is effective, because Darwinism effectively discredits the Judeo-Christian conception of the sanctity of human life, therefore abortion, euthanasia, and infanticide can be morally justified. We've discussed Peter Singer before. This is the disgusting atheist. We've already mentioned his claims, his public claims before. What's interesting is that these atheists claim that Christianity is immoral and disgusting and look how many you've killed and blah, blah, blah. And then here they turn around and say, well, Christianity fights for the sanctity of human life, believes in the sanctity of human life. We atheists don't and we, we endorse abortion, euthanasia and infanticide. And this is all moral. That is, that's, <laughs> that is hypocrisy from atheists. So this is a confirmation of the brutalizing tendencies of Darwinism predicted by Darwin's Cambridge mentor, Adam Sedgwick. Right? Yes, Andrew, the you know, Canada's gone down this road. So Darwinist science devalues human life. I've made this claim and I'll say it again. We just get some water. So Cedric did not have to wait very long to have his fears confirmed. Darwinists in the late 19th century began applying Darwinism to ethical issues, including questions about the value of human life, including this little tour up here. Robbie Kosman, a German zoologist who later became a medical professor, wrote in an 1880 essay, The Importance of the Life of an Individual in the Darwinian World View. He declared that the Darwinian world view must look upon the present sentimental conception of the value of the life of a human individual as an overestimate, completely hindering the progress of humanity. We have overestimated your value. If you would kindly kill yourself, report for death, or if we can just take you out and shoot you as a, you know, giving, well, the bullet's worth more than you are. This would lead to the progress of humanity. And this eventually led to what we would call death camps and the gulags and socialism. Yeah. Justified legal murder because it's not actually murder. It's actually helping life along. Killing a hundred million of you, that's, that's actually, we're making way for the superior species, don't you know? That is what Darwin enabled, psychopathic murder and genocide justified as science. This is what Darwin brought the world. Yes, Darwin did justify psychopathy and sociopathy and every kind of opathy. Exactly. Yeah, so as Andrew Martin says, devaluing human life, if life becomes inconvenient, just end it. And this is what we are left with. This is satanic. This is cruel. This is disgusting. So where's my little atheist friend that was here earlier? Yeah, this is what atheist brings to the world. This is the atheist alternative. So we go from Christianity, which according to these atheist PhDs, um, sanctifies human life, to this that says, well, yeah, we don't really like that baby. It's only a year old. It's two years old. Ah, just kill it. The human state, also like every animal community of individuals, must reach an even higher level of perfection if the possibility exists through the destruction of the less well-endowed individual. Ooh, you don't look so smart. I think we need to kill you. For the more excellently endowed to win space for the expansion of its progeny. Oh, Hitler needed some living space. Mm. Wonder where that idea came from, Mr. Darwin. I wonder. So, yes, the biblical quote, all those who hate me love death. So, we've already shown, we've demonstrated, I believe, beyond all doubt, 
Darwinism was explicitly and specifically anti-Christian, as is communism. So the state only has an interest in preserving the more excellent life at the expense of the less excellent. So understand, you don't look so excellent to me, you gots to go. Do you understand this is what Darwinism leads to? This is quite bluntly Darwin morality, and it is murder. I, I don't know, this is shocking to me. It is, it is filthy, it makes my skin crawl. <coughs> But this is the satanic work of Charles Darwin. Herbert Spencer, <clears throat> so let's talk about theft and Christians. So by the early 20th century, Kosman's ideas had spread, especially as the Darwinian eugenics movement, defining itself as the science of improving human heredity. Okay, so they were going to, they were going to use their science to improve the human species, to make you better and smarter. So Herbert Spencer lived from 1820 to 1903. He's an English philosopher, biologist, and anthropologist, and sociologist. He's known for his evolutionary ideas and sociological theories. He's a major proponent of social Darwinism, and he coined the phrase survival of the fittest to replace the struggle for existence. Because the struggle for existence means that you won't survive, where struggle for existence is a somewhat more polite way of saying, please die for us so that we can get your stuff and, you know, so, uh, no, 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 no. One day, you know, I need to do a presentation on a on a concept because seriously, once I'm in looking at Calvin, I mean, here's a question. Just, just please, guys, I want your opinion. Okay. Is this true? Once shaved, always shaved. Is this true? Once shaved, always shaved. Once shaved, you never have to shave again. I mean, is that true? Or am I just, or am I missing something? Because I shaved a couple of days ago and I'm having a problem here because because I was told once shaved, always shaved. I got one of those once shaved razors. So I don't know, once shaved, if I don't shave for three days, I start growing a carpet on my face. So apparently, but this is theological doctrine, believe it or not. This is legit. This is 100% legit. I hear this on YouTube, man. Once shaved, always shaved. Yeah. So yeah, guys, apparently this is this is proper the theolo theology, something like that. Yeah, yeah, once shaved, always shaved. I'm going to do a story on that. So I mean, yeah. Anywho, so moving on. So writing in psychology, economics, and ethics, his works were highly influential in the 19th century. He's still cited in modern academic writing, so he's still influential today. This survival of the fittest, which I have here sought to express in mechanical terms, of course, mechanical determinism, and of course, atheism, is that which Mr. Darwin has called natural selection. Ah, so we have the struggle for existence, which means killing people, murdering them, genociding them, and it's okay, it's moral, it's fine. He's now calling it survival of the fittest, but it's what Mr. Darwin calls natural selection. So these are the same thing. He's not telling us, hold on, natural selection just means kill your neighbor. Or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Well, that was the subtitle of Darwin's book. Preservation of the favored races. Well, we're the favored races. We don't like you guys because we're favored. Because we're the favored ones. Uh, why are we favored? Well, because we say so. No, Darwin was shaved. Darwin only grew a beard in at the age of 53 because he became incredibly famous because of his book. And so he decided at the age of 53 to grow a beard. So until the age of 53, he had no beard. He grew a beard to disguise himself because he became notorious. A lot of people, yeah, full of shame. He wanted to hide himself. He was, yeah, he definitely had a sense of shame for what he did. Favored by who? Exactly, favored by themselves. So, Principles of Biology, 1865, Part 3, Chapter 12. So, people are beginning to see that the first requisite to success in life is to be a good animal. Be a good animal. Thanks, thanks, Herbert. Thanks, Herbert. Appreciate it. A clever theft was praiseworthy among the Spartans. And it is equally so amongst Christians, provided it be on a sufficiently large scale. You see, so... Christians will steal your stuff, and if you do it on a large enough scale, they'll praise it as good. But we Darwinists, we are moral. We're just going to murder everybody and take their stuff. We'll wipe out 80% of their errors, and we'll just lie about it, hide it, and we'll never talk about it because we don't do that. We're, we're the moral Darwinists. We're the moral atheists. So do you understand the, the hypocrisy of these people? So anti-Christian liars. Yeah, once shaved, always saved, shaved sounds very convenient. Yeah, it sounds very convenient. If someone can tell me where I can get that, please let me know. So Darwin and survival of the fittest, I have called this principle by which each slight variation, if useful, is preserved by the term natural selection. Well, how do you preserve it, right? And how do you remove things you don't want to preserve? You, well, you, as we saw from the German 
academics, theologians, politicians, you kill what you don't like. The expression often used by Mr. Herbert Spencer of the survival of the fittest is more accurate than struggle for existence and is sometimes equally convenient. Uh Uh-huh. So survival of the fittest, it's a bit more vague, it's a bit more of a euphemism, but equally convenient. It means the same thing, in other words. So Darwin agrees. What would a good animal do? Yes, vegetal, good point. So the scientists who questioned Darwin's theory were not moralizing biblical literalists. Understand, many scientists questioned Darwin. They were not Bible-bashing crazies. Charles Lyell was not, and Wallace wasn't even Christian at all, and Wallace was his co-founder of the idea of natural selection. He was very, very spiritual, if, if in the occultic sense. So they believe that Darwin had brushed aside too many serious questions about the explanatory power of natural selection, inheritance, the fossil record, and geology to be convinced of its scientific validity. Welcome, Iron Rex, Simon said. Welcome, Sergeant Grinch. All right. Darwin ignored all of their concerns and evidence, just as Darwinists do today. So let's have a look at a civic biology. I'll go a few more pages, go a little while. So this is from 1914. The Evolution of Man. This is a textbook. So this is a very famous textbook. It led to a massive court case. But let's have a look. This is a civic a civic school system textbook, an American school system textbook. And let's see what it says about Darwinism. Evolution of man. Undoubtedly, there once lived upon the earth races of men who were much lower in their mental organization than the present inhabitants. If we follow the early history of man upon the earth, we find that at first he must have been little better than one of the lower animals. So man was a lower animal, not very smart. This is a civil biology presented in Problems by George blah blah blah. He was a nomad, wandering from place to place, feeding upon whatever living things he could kill with his hands, just like Darwin did. For fun, like a psychopath would. Gradually, he must have learned to use weapons and thus kill his prey, first using rough stone implements for this purpose, like Darwin did. Darwin killed animals with stones. He threw them to death with stones. He killed rabbits and birds, and Darwin liked doing it. As man becomes more civilized, implements of bronze and of iron were used. About this time, the subjugation and domestication of animals began to take place. Man began to cultivate fields and to have a fixed place of abode other than a cave. The beginnings of civilization were long ago, but even today the earth is not entirely civilized. Oh my, we still have people who are little better than one of the lower animals. And we saw what they did. They stuck them in zoos and they said, these these black people are not sophisticated, not advanced. They are, we Darwinists, we know that this guy's little better than a baboon, you see. So that's where science has taken us. This is what atheists want to do. This is what atheists have done. Evolution of man, undoubtedly the ones, so, uh, did I make a typo here? The races of man, so, at the present time there exists upon the earth five races or varieties of man. The highest type of all is the Caucasians, represented by the civilized white inhabitants of Europe and America. Now, to annoy people, I'm going to say that, yes, I do think European civilization is the pinnacle of development in the world. But this is because of moral grounds. This is because of their Christian heritage. This is because of the way that they think, their work ethic. Because as a culture, they have developed better ways of thinking than have other cultures. Not based on genetic grounds necessarily, but because they haven't done stupid things. Like if you look at black races, you look at these Southern African black races, like where I come from, the tribal groups. These people are inbred in the extreme. They're the second most inbred group after the Arabs. And this has led to genetic damage and this has affected their development. So yeah, but this is a bad cultural tradition that needs to stop. Europeans stopped all of these nonsense and therefore they flourished. So it's not necessarily because they are genetically better, but yes, ultimately because of good practices, they are healthier, they're cleaner and so on. This does lead to improvement, certainly. But but yeah, there's there's the fact that these they've done well because good thoughts, good habits, and this has led to the flourishing of their particular culture. If other cultures would adopt good ideas, they too would flourish and not, not be wandering around in the swamps. So, improvement of man. If the stock of domesticated animals can be improved, it is not unfair to ask if the health and vigor of the future generations of men and women on the earth might not be improved by applying to them the laws of selection. In other words, if we would simply apply the same principles we apply on livestock, on animals, on breeding dogs and breeding chickens and breeding rabbits and breeding cattle, if we would do the same thing and stop people from breeding through government policy and castrate others and be 
whatever. If we can, if we can, if we can do that. We can improve human life. Did you know that? So we just got to make this government policy, and we're going to make the world a better place. Do you understand where this leads to? So this improvement of the future race has a number of factors in which we as individuals may play a part. Yeah, through government policy, just join the government. They are, these are personal hygiene, selection of healthy mates. Yeah, don't marry those deficient genetic people over there. Think Germany, World War II, and the betterment of the environment. So notice environmentalism, which we have today, the religion, the, religion, the green religion, the religion of environmentalism equals eugenics, the betterment of the environment. It's just paganism. It's simply just, you know, you, you're back to just, just paganism, earth worship. We could then have the Übermensch. Exactly. Do you get the idea? Do you see within, given the context, what's in this book and what the implications are? They don't come out and say it, although the early Germans were saying, yeah, we just need to kill everyone. They were saying it, but do you understand the implications? The, the language is different, but the implications are the same. Um, let me see. Atheism is a religion until it's demanding to be taught in school, then it's just science, of course. Yeah, it is a religion. It's legally. Atheism is, under the U.S. court system, under the U.S. legal system, atheism is a religion. It went to the U.S. Supreme Court. It has been declared a religion. Atheism is a religion. Yes, Charon, you are the carbon that they want to reduce. Yeah, so eugenics. Now, this is in the textbook, okay, on eugenics in the civic biology. When people marry, there are certain things that the individuals, as well as the race, should demand. Epilepsy and feeble-mindedness are handicaps, which it is not only unfair, but criminal to hand down to posterity. So don't have disabled children, okay? Don't have disabled children. So, you know, do a scientific test on your mate and kill the baby if it's born and it's, or you, you know, just kill it because, because yeah, it's criminal. This is against the law. Do you understand the implication? Do you understand where the whole idea comes from for you? This, this is eugenic. This was taught. This was in the US school system. The science of being well-born is called eugenics. Eugenics is the science, the science of being well born, the science of genocide. So then they speak here of parasitism and its cost to society. Hundreds of families, such as those described above, exist today, spreading disease, immorality, and crime to all parts of this country. The cost to society of such families is very severe. Just as certain animals or plants become parasitic on other plants or animals, these families have become parasitic on society. They not only do harm to others by corrupting, stealing, or spreading disease, but they are actually protected and cared for by the state out of public money. Largely for them, the poor house and the asylum exist. They take from society, but they give nothing in return. They are true parasites. Now, how do they know they're parasites? Because this is science. Like, what do you mean? This is scientific. This is science talking. Yeah, keep the population under 500 million. Yeah, of course, just kill the rest. Yeah, because of climate change and dwindling resources, well, we have to permanently reduce the carbon footprint. Exactly. So, the civic biology, 1904, okay, section 4, 1914, section 4. The remedy, if such people were lower animals, we would probably kill them off to prevent them from spreading. Oh my, I hope you guys aren't a lower animal and that these guys don't get into government because they might have to according to their own words, kill you off to prevent you from spreading. Humanity will not allow this, but we do have the remedy of separating the sexes in asylums or other places and in various ways preventing intermarriage and the possibility of perpetuating such a low and degenerate race. I hope you don't belong to that race, guys. I hope you are not part of that race. Um, yeah, let me just do something quickly. Ah. Yep. So, what are you what are you learning from this at the moment? What are you, what are you gaining from from this? Because um, this is, yeah. I mean, this this to me is just just really disturbing. So, remedies of this sort have been tried successfully in Europe and are now meeting with success in this country. So, what we learn from Darwinian science: first, dehumanize those you dislike, then do the reasonable Darwinian thing and abuse or remove the societal pollution with extreme prejudice. Rachel, they enjoy being parasitic. Yeah. And so the preservation of favored races. So Hitler believed that the nation had become weak, the German nation, corrupted by dysgenics as opposed to eugenics and the infusion of degenerate elements into its bloodstream. And yes, Stephen Young, exactly. Apparently, Jesus taught us to feed parasites. 
So instead of helping other societies to be better, like Jesus says, they wipe them out like Darwin says, the thief only comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Indeed, yes. So Hitler praised Sparta. He considered Sparta to be the first folkish state. He endorsed what he perceived to be an early eugenics treatment of deformed children. Hitler said, Sparta must be regarded as the first folkish state. The exposure of the sick, the weak, deformed children, in short, their destruction, was more decent and in truth a thousand times more humane than the wretched insanity of our day which preserves the most pathological subject, and indeed at any price, and yet takes the life of a hundred thousand healthy children in consequence of birth control or through abortions, in order subsequently to breed a race of degenerates burdened with illnesses. So this is Mr. Hitler, and notice Right? He's talking about the race, and here we've got, on the origin of species, remember, Darwin wrote the preservation of favored races. And they are saying, don't, don't favor the bad races, you want the favored races. Yeah, so guys, uh, your thoughts on, what have you learned from this so far? What are you taking from this? So, let me see, have I missed any comments? All right, now... Did Marx offer to dedicate Capital, Das Capital, to Darwin, a reassessment of the evidence? So, let's have a look. The intellectual relationship between Marx's science of historical materialism and Darwin's theory of the evolution of species has been a topic of controversy ever since Marx's death, when Engels linked the two names together in his funeral eulogy at Marx's graveside. Just as Darwin discovered the law of evolution in organic nature, so Karl Marx discovered the law of evolution in human history. And he was really, really happy because he and Darwin had the same ideas. Darwin supported his ideas, Darwin in one sphere, him in another, and the two were just a match made in heaven. All participants to the controversy agreed that Marx did offer to dedicate the culmination of his life's work, Das Kapital, to Darwin, and that Darwin declined the offer. So even Karl Marx, so we're going to see plenty that Hitler was very much enamored with Darwin, Hitler's ideas were very much based upon Darwin. And of course, Karl Marx himself was really, really happy with Darwin. Darwinism, a real inspiration. Dear sir, I thank you for the honor which you have done me by sending me your great work on capital. And I heartily wish that I was more worthy to receive it by understanding more of the deep and important subject of political economy. Though our studies have been so different, I believe that we both earnestly desire the extension of knowledge. This is Darwin writing to Karl Marx. And that this is in the long run sure to add to the happiness of mankind. Darwin is saying here that Karl Marx and himself are going to add to the happiness of mankind. I remain, dear sir, yours faithfully, Charles Darwin, to Karl Marx on a, in October 1873. So yes, Karl Marx did offer it. <laughs> happiness of mankind, yes. So, Clown Marx and Darwin. Clown Marx sent a signed copy of Das Kapital to Darwin because Darwinism provided the quote-unquote scientific foundation for his dialectical materialism. Darwin's evolutionary theory proposed that advantageous traits are more likely to survive and reproduce. He provided a scientific explanation for the diversity and development of life on Earth. Whereas we've got historical materialism, Marx's dialectical materialism argued that Historical development is driven by the conflict between social classes. Darwin had the conflict between animals, the lower races and the higher races. Darwin between the upper class and the lower class. You know, you get that. Where the ruling class exploits the working class over resources. It emphasized material conditions and economic factors. Whereas Darwinism, because of Keynesian economics, also emphasized material conditions and economic factors, oddly enough. Two devils giving praise to each other. Yes. Both preach evolving societies, materialism, progress, and amorality. Darwin's evolutionary principles for the development of life on Earth resonated with Marx's desire for a scientific basis to understand the development of human societies. So Darwin gave impetus to Marx as a science. And I will, you know, I should pause here. There's one more slide. Um, yeah, I'm still busy working on this slide. Obviously, it's not, it's still raw. It's not done. There's plenty to be said. Ah, so you know what? I'm going to stop here, guys. I'll end it here. I'll work on the rest of the slides. This is going to go to about 130, 140 slides. So, um, yeah. So, hopefully... So, I'll stop here. But understand there's an overlap here with Darwin and Karl Marx, Darwin and Hitler, Darwin and the First World War. The man produced genocide on an incredible scale. Yeah. 
So yeah, that's that. So hopefully you've learned something. Hopefully you found something useful. And um, yeah, I will soon do a talk. I will do my next part, my next talk on Calvin, John Calvin, John Moses Calvin. No, sorry, John, the second coming of Moses Calvin. We need to talk about that, the second coming of Moses in the way of Calvin. You keep finding these gems, Lloyd. It'll ruffle some serious feathers. These revelations have serious implications. Thank you. Yeah, it, it, yeah, I do dig. I mean, I have to get a whole lot of resources and index them and then read through them. I've got to, but also knowing what to search for, knowing how to connect all the dots. I mean, that that's taken years to develop the skill. Um, interesting. We are interested in competing with Jesus Christ and Buddha for the destiny of man from Favored Races Manifesto by James L. Hart. That's interesting. I'm going to just copy that quote and... I'm just making note of it, so I'll look it up later. Um, Darwinism is Satanism disguised. I would agree, Natalie Hartz, yes. So, yeah, let's see. Uh, you're welcome, Natalie Hartz. So, what have you guys learned? What have you taken away from this? Uh, I mean, hopefully this has been educational, but please take screenshots, make memes, use this stuff, use it on your so your Facebook posts. I mean, let me know how you use this. And um, also, as I said, I've, I've just written an article. Um, as a response to, to claims that were made... Um, in a talk a few weeks ago, um, I've had time to I've had to really stop and think about some of the claims that were made, and then certain certain statements were made that claimed that I was I was using a completely a well known false source for as a source for my discussions on monotheism. That is a false claim. That is an entirely erroneous claim. I will deal with that in the future. And um, yeah. Count Buga says, seems communism is just the reverse of Darwin's ideas where the successful are the parasites and need to be cleansed. Great. Yeah, it's like, yeah, true. I mean, look, these are Gnostics. They're fighting over and it's nonsense, right? They're all going to make up the... Look, wh when you are all fighting over the truth like this because you're, and you're starting on an erroneous basis, you're gonna you're just going to end up on error, right? So you're going to have completely contradictory ideas. Is that different to Protestantism where people have utterly contradictory ideas? Only one of those ideas can be correct. Right when you when someone is saying no, there's seven sacraments, and another one saying no, there's three, another one is saying there's one. Look, man, these are numbers. The, only one of them can be right. Only one of them can be right. So someone is wrong. But of course, the Protestant position is well. Let's not embarrass everyone. Let's just kind of well. Okay. In fact, Martin Luther was was calling Calvin a heretic and really going at and Anabaptists and Zwingli was going at him and they were going at it. so. And, and then in other ways, you look at modern ecumenical councils. They try to well, they are let's let's just try to agree and pretend we're all just brothers in Christ and get along and ignore the stuff that we completely and utterly disagree and contradict each other about. So yeah, a lot of Catholic exorcists say that demons love calling humans apes and animals. Well, yeah, okay. Thank you for providing structure to the parallel between Marx and Darwin. It really helps you. Welcome. Yeah, I got that from, um, I got a lot, a lot of this material from uh, a Marxist webpage, if I recall. Uh, Marxist.org, I think. <clears throat> no, I don't have any notes here, but I, I had to look through stuff. And I've got on the next page here, uh, this one. Oh, sorry, hold on. Let me, this one. There's some, I'm getting some of this from Darwin and Modern Science, Cambridge University. And I've got some from Marxist.org or something like that. But I've, I've, I still, I'm still working on some of this stuff. Socialism, utopian, and scientific, um, blah, blah, blah. He talks about Darwin here. I mean, the guy in his eulogy at Karl Marx's funeral spoke about Darwin. Why would you mention Darwin at Marx's funeral? I mean, that, that's just the weirdest thing. So clearly Darwin was very, very important to Marx. Have you seen the evidence of letters between Lincoln and Marx? No, I didn't know about that. No, I did not know about that. So guys, thank you. I should call it a night here. It's been an hour and 15 minutes. I hope it's been educational, hopefully entertaining as well. Um, yeah. So let me know what you, what you gained from it. Love to see your comments and yeah. And yeah, I don't know what else I should say. Um, obviously there's, there's my coffee shop that I have at the moment and, um, I will be making these available. And for those who are members, um, if you're a member of my coffee shop, please, I'm really bad at this. I'm still trying to figure out all this works. Um, I'm offering you a free presentation, which is the, for this month, for last month rather, which is, um, nonsense right that was voted upon and so let me know and um yeah and uh, for those on youtube please check the uh, membership section for a post on that and yeah i've got a new post up as well discussing the 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 serious implications for people throwing calvin under the sorry luther under the bus by lutherans distancing themselves from luther that has serious implications so guys have a wonderful day um i will see you soon i'll be talking about calvin soon and thank you again for the really great support. It's been fantastic. I appreciate it. I'm very humbled. If you have any questions, let me know. And guys, if you have any other topics you want me to think about, 
do let me know. I will be doing a part three at least on Calvin, and um, I'll see you guys soon. All right, catch you in the comments. See ya, bye.